this also. Okay, dear friends of minerals and gemstones, welcome to our second lecture in the context of our exhibition at the Natural History Museum, at the National Museum of Natural History in Luxembourg from dark uh, to light. Um, thank you for your active interest. Um, we have today our most successful webinar. More than 100 people have registered already. So that's for us, it's a great, great, great success. Uh, myself, my name is Patrick Michaeli. I'm head of communication at the museum and your host this evening. So the curator of our um, exhibition uh, is also, and also the curator of our mineralogical uh, collection, Simon Philippot, presented a month ago a first overview uh, about uh, gemstones, uh, general overview. Today, the museum scientific collaborator, Peter Lickberg, is presenting more precisely gemstones from Russia. So before I know, uh, now pass over to Simon Philippot, who will introduce Peter Lickberg to you a few words about the procedure. If you have any question, ask them, write them in the chat. Uh, we will pass them to Peter after or at the ending of uh, the talk. The same applies to viewers on Facebook. We are broadcast live on Facebook. So ask your question, write your question in the comment of uh, Facebook. We will pass them also at the end of the conference to Peter. Um, if you have any question about the technology, about uh, how, uh, if something is going wrong on Zoom, so uh, write them uh, in the Q and A um, in uh, the menu bar of uh, the Zoom window. And uh, yeah, that's all for me. If uh, you, I wish you a very enjoyable and uh, exciting lecture. And now it's up to you, Simon, to present Peter. Thank you, Patrick. So this evening, I have the pleasure to introduce you my colleague and friend, Peter Ligbert. Peter is scientific collaborator of my department at the National History Museum in Luxembourg, and is expert in mineralogy of ore deposit and especially in granitic pegmatite. We both are attracted by the rare elements found in pegmatite and especially by gem mineral generated in this type of deposit. Peter has a great interest in genesis of this deposit and history of mining. So, you know, Peter is Swedish and he started very early to study mineral deposits in Scandinavia. <coughs> he studied civil geology and geology in Sweden and then traveled the world to describe vein containing crystalline situ to gain a better understanding of the specific process that created the most wonderful crystal on the earth. He soon became an expert in the field especially in Scandinavian, Russian, and Pakistan one, and it's for why he's there today. He's also a member of the editorial board of the mineralogical journal, Minarian Welt. So Peter has been working and living in Luxembourg since 1997. We met at this period and were directly connected. During this time, it became a true friendship with the same passion on mineral beauties and their scientific analysis. We did some very rich travel together also. So Peter has an impressive collection with content through masterpieces of nature and is enriched by a lot of research specimen. Some of those are presented in our special um, exhibit from dark to light. Like this species, especially this species, we didn't talk about this one today, but it's a very special species. So Peter has published more than 60 article and book chapter and has been demanded to speak at several international conferences in all six continent in geology, mineralogy and gemology in the past 20 years. So I don't want to talk more. A lot of people are connected now. They know Peter very well. So Peter, I give you the lead. 
Thank you very much for the introduction, both of you. <clears throat> and yes, I can just uh, put a word for the exhibit which Dr. Simon Filippo put uh, together. I just handed over 10 boxes of specimens, so I didn't do much at all, that was easy. But to prepare such an exhibit and put it out and do all the text, this is, uh, I think, two years of work and it's very well worth seeing. And it's presented with some history, some historical local pieces, some local very old gems, and some, uh, we come to the genesis of gems with the big hole with the igneous magmatic uh, gem pegmatite specimens, and then over to metamorphic. And then also there's a side, a part of gemology, how you study, how you see fake versus correct or oiled uh, emeralds and so on. And then there's a last section where the visitor can see from crystals to the cut stones to jewelry design. So I think the main layout, which Dr. Filippo did, that's an excellent thing. Now I will take you to one of the countries that we present. We present in the pegmatite sections, uh, four countries with pegmatites. And I will now take you, let's see, take you to Russia. <clears throat> Did you get it? It's perfect. Yes? Okay, very good. Okay, here we go. So I will introduce you to Russian gems from Russia with love. And I choose this picture I did some years ago just before Christmas. Moscow is very, very beautiful now. It's a symbol of the aesthetic of Russia, I would say. You can see the beautiful cathedral on the red square. But also you have those treasures that are very little known. They're uh, great treasures in Russia, not only mineralogical museums, in Moscow, only in Moscow, there are eight geological mineralogical museums, which I think is a world record. Paris has three wonderful museums. Moscow has many, and same uh, as St. Petersburg also has several. Now, what is the difference to most Euro uh, other European countries is that Russia has some incredible gem deposits. Of course, it's the biggest country on the planet. And I will give you an introduction to some of the history and to some of the deposits. And when I was a small boy at the Museum of Natural History in my home city, Gothenburg in Sweden, there was a small emerald in matrix and a small heliodor that piqued my interest really as a small toddler, almost three, four years old. I was very fascinated. When I was eight, nine years old, I planned to go to Russia. It was Soviet Union at the time and impossible. So it took me many, many years to do my first dream trip. And I went to see Ural uh, gem pegmatites and emerald mines and many ore deposits in May, June, 1992. And it was really hard work. So I was the first Western foreigner, the first foreigner out of Soviet Union since before the Russian revolution to do this. And I will share with you some pictures from this old time. They're not the best quality. And I will show, uh, share newer pictures of beautiful specimens and geology. So here is newer by, by uh, Jeff Scoville, an American photographer. These are some of the most beautiful gems from Russia. But because of the size of the country, they have a lot of different gems. And each one of those you see here, I will describe a little bit in detail. Now, if we look at the country, it has 11 time zones. So if you want to travel there over New Year, you can have 11 time celebration, which is in fact, it's often if you're staying in a hotel that they will celebrate every hour. Is there anyone from Kamchatka? Yes. Is there anyone from next Magadan Oblast? Is somebody from Irkutsk and so on, which is quite funny. Now, when it comes to geology, if we start from the West, uh, there is not so much from St. Petersburg to the Urals or Moscow to Urals. The Kola Peninsula is very interesting, a lot of rare minerals. There are many, many hundred species of which many are uh, unique to the Kola Peninsula with some interesting, some are of gem quality, but very rare minerals. We're not going to talk about those. We will start in the Ural Mountains, which are north-south 2000 kilometer long mountain chain. So there was a collision between two tectonic plates 300 million years ago. And I will show you briefly the geological map that all the structures are north-south going. And if you make a cross section of just a few kilometers, you have from platinum gold deposits to gemstone deposits to emerald deposits. And then in the plains of which you see the green area, that's his main name, Ural. Ural is in fact the Ural Mountains primarily, but there is a lot of gas and, and uh, oil fields there. And then when we come further east in Siberia, you see the brownish where it becomes more higher mountains. 
to the very south um, from Novosibirsk and south, the Altai Mountains produce both many ores and interesting gems. And if we go over to Lake Baikal in the south, the biggest sweetwater lake on the planet at the southern end, there's some deposits with spinel, lazurite, uh, a little bit to the south, Malkhansk Mountain with tourmaline by Aginskoye here in this area, the border to China, Mongolia, we have some very old Dadon, Chilon, Sherlovagora, pegmatite and Grayson deposits. And if we go north, we have the Yakutsk, Mirne, the big diamond fields here, which were only discovered the last 70 years. They did find diamonds long before that in Siberia. So here is just some of the Russian jade pegmatites. We're going to visit the areas. And I write here the difference between the impossible and the possible lies in the man's determination. So some people say I'm a little crazy, but I was very, very determined to go to see the mines in the Urals, even as young. Here is the geology of Russia, and you can see the Urals as the white, brown, yellow line. And you can see, of course, further east, a huge area, twice the size of Europe, which is very, very right, and they have a lot of interesting deposits. Now, after the revolution, we knew very little. We knew, like, the, for instance, the emerald from the Ural Mountains, big emerald, 20 centimeter. We knew that they had been finding this from 1830 till the Russian Revolution, but we had no idea what was going on there. Uh, here are in details the Ural Mountains. I've listened to the photographers here, which I'm very grateful to uh, borrow some crystals. Uh, now, if you look to the, the red spots here, are pegmatite areas. Gem pegmatites are, are doing Mursinka down Ilmen Mountains, and you can see it's sown on the eastern side of the Euros. And up north, I no, I marked a region with a lot of quartz crystals. I would just briefly mention and show some large crystals. Now from dark to light, here is my son to, to the right. And in fact, he has a couple of specimens in the exhibit here, also from, from Russia. The big tourmaline up here is his and, and so on. And these all pieces are from Russia in that case. I will just introduce briefly igneous magmatic rock. That means that is molten. Here, they've come up to the surface. This is in Chile now. Now, what if it doesn't reach the surface? It will crystallize, for instance, if it reaches silica as a granite. And here you see to the left veins of pegmatite and to the right, a thicker pegmatite vein. This is from Sweden. Here is the same thin, which is starting to become pegmatite in gra granite. And here is another granite to the left and pegmatite vein in granite. So it means pegmatite means it's big grains. So when a huge intrusion forms in the mountain orogeny, it also becomes richer in the rare elements. Here you can see a little bit of metamorphic rocks uh, with pegmatite, which was plastic when the pegmatite intruded. So you can see the shape uh, is a bit rounded. This is just to show you the different ages of the various pegmatite. You see from California, Himalaya mountains, the youngest, you're also around 300 million years, Brazil, Scandinavia. Those are number of pegmatite fields. So we can see that during the formation of the earth, there are very, very clear periods when different ore deposits like diamonds, man, most are very, very old, not all, and uh, pegmatites of different types were formed. We have volume deposits, uh, 1.7, 1.7. This type in Rapa Kivi granites are typical for this period of the planet. And here are quite a few uh, gem pegmatites, just so you have an idea around. They don't only occur in Russia, but many there. This is just a picture from one in Norway, but it's good to illustrate how large the crystals are, up to a meter, sometimes up to 11 meter or even more. Now the imperial court in Russia, they were known, Russia was perhaps the richest country in the world, or perhaps it was China, who knows at the time, just before Russian revolution. And they were known for having incredible jewelry. So was in, in, the, in Iran, in Persia, as they traded all the diamonds coming from Golconda mines in India. And they, so Russia, they had a big cutting factory where they cut faster stone cabochon, made huge carvings in Yekaterinburg. And they, this one of the things that Russia is very famous for is the malachite. Here from Isaac's Cathedral in St. Petersburg. To the left, you can see the purple shower white was only found the first time 1937 and only described, I think, 1978 by uh, Vera Rogova. And it's in fact a magmatic, it's you know, we described metasomatic, but the later study has shown it's a magmatic uh, formation. 
And in the middle, we have the rhodonite and then malachite. So this is also typical. It's not only um, clear, faceting grade material, but also uh, decorated materials that we can say is a gemstone for sure. And here is more of the beauty of Russia, of course. Incredible. Now, what we know when I was young and before I went to Russia, I was not much. What was published in all books by Fersman, which are right here, here are Fersman books. Alabashka pegmatized very poor images. There were small diggings in the surface between swamps in the forest. We knew they had the most beautiful blue topaz in the oldest later they found in Brazil. And we will first go to the Ura Mountains and then off to Lake Baikal, Malchansk, Shelova, Gora, Donchilona, and up to Yakutia. Here you can see the geological map of Urals, and you can see north-south. So if we make a cross section, we will look at a more detail. We have granitic rocks, I could, would say, in the middle. And on both on the east and west of them, we have rocks containing, um, which are more iron rich, darker dunites and so on, diorites. We have serpentinites, and where they come in contact with the granite intrusion, you form both mineralization from solutions from the granite and just heating, where you don't get elements necessarily from the granite, but the metasomatic and metamorphic deposits around. And the most famous is topaz. The first specimen that I could find so far came to Germany in 1747 of topaz. In Russian literature, they start to describe that it was in the early 1800s, they started mining topaz, but it was in fact earlier. Of course, in those days, they didn't uh, care so much about writing down everything. But I must say that the Russian Museum, despite two world wars, Russian revolution, they have an incredible uh, control of all the information. They are really, really masters. I know many other museums in Western Europe are as well, Vienna Museum, London, uh, Stockholm, Oslo, I've visited many museums in Germany, also many German museums but real good information exactly when it came to the museum from home and so on. And this is something we should never forget. Here's a beautiful from the Mursinka Alabashka pegmatites, feldspar with smoky quartz. And now here comes an important cross section. If you look to the left here, the pink in the right half is the granite intrusion. To the right of it, we have the contact with serpentinites. Here you will have the formation with barrel from the granite to form emerald and chrysoberyl, some of it the new uh, variety alexandrite, which was discovered for the southern Europe. It's in this contact zone. To the west here, here we have pegmatite region. The granite is dipping down. Some pegmatites are within the granite, some here, some are outside. And here are other units. Here also, what is not well known is on the Alabashka River, there are also uh, marbles with spinel, they mined even corundum from some of the uh, st uh, streams here. And here I made uh, with some of the main deposits on Alabasca Mursinka. And the purple was the amethyst. Here is a picture from Mursinka village from uh, a friend of mine's daughter who I found uh, the uh, friend in the USA that she was online and Sergei Borsha was a, a geologist who worked in the mines here in the 80s and 90s when I first visited, 92. So here I marked all the yellow ones are pegmatites. Now nearby are younger hydrothermal veins which are filled with amethyst. And the Russian Siberian amethyst, they were or originally called Mursinka amethyst. And people couldn't remember the name, then they started to call them Siberian amethyst. But when I was a kid, the best gemologist in my home city, he still called them Mursinka amethysts. And here is from Adui River in the south of that same Adui Mursink intrusion, a very famous found in 1926 that in, where a photo was taken. Of course, there were very, very few photographs from those days. So when I go somewhere, I always try to document with photographs, the miners, the veins, see in situ the pockets and everything found. Here you see a detailed map that was given to me by the, it's all hand painted by the chief geologist of the last mining company who mined those pegmatites and amethyst veins. So the chief geologist came to visit me in Sweden many years ago and gave me this map, which was a great honor. And here is from my first visit, first visits in 1916 underground. And this was about as much as one knew about Russian gem mines. So it's a very good illustration of it. Now it was very dangerous times to go in Russia. 
Here I'm with the chief uh, geologist Alexander Roshkov. To the right, I'm in a pocket. Here you can see some. This was a four meter big pocket. Peckham type veins here are almost vertical, uh, narrow, just two, three, four, five meters, most of them. There is one which I will speak about later, which is huge. And uh, there are uh, some of them, that, which is pegmatite veins, just many veins. Here were the crystals I saw on my first visits. Some beautiful, I could buy the one in the middle on my second visit, but they wouldn't even sell it the first time. They were not interested in money. And in fact, chief geologist here, Alexander Rosco, he was very fascinated that I was a Westerner who was not just interested in money, but I was interested in the real geology. And it took me one day discussion looking at geological maps before he even mentioned that they had mines open. And then he said, tomorrow we're going to see the mines. And then during several days, we went to see the mines and then I came back. That was in May, June, 92. And because the old miners, they worked between the swamps, they could only work when the ground was frozen, when it was minus 30, 40 degrees in winter. So I went back in January, uh, 1993. Just during such conditions, minus 41, it was as coldest to see the real. Here is Mursinka village. Now in Mursinka in 1668, they found the first gemstones in the small rolling hills around Mursinka. And you wonder when I came there, they were still very poor people. they had been mining gemstones for hundreds of years, more than 350 years. And still they were not wealthy. You see 1992. Beautiful old timber houses. Some of them reminded me uh, completely. This one is Russian style. Some were completely typical Swedish. And then I found out when they built this in Sikmer in 1640, they sent a lot of war prisoners who were Swedish. Sweden was attacking Russia all the time. I don't know why in the world we would do that. We wouldn't now for sure. So Mursinka became extremely famous all over the world and still is, but specimens are very rare because production stopped. So to the left, you see a beautiful specimen. And I'll tell you more about this in a minute. And to the right, you see several of the best pieces found in the Urals. Here is a mineral show in Mursinka. And they have many. The church in Mursinka is geological museum. This is looking north. And on the hills in the backside is the most famous amethyst mine, the Talian, that started in the 1700s. Meba River. And here are the, <clears throat> the map. You can see Yekaterinburg and you see Alabaska, Mursinka, Vatika is amethyst mine. Sarapulka, Lipovka are tourmaline mines, but it's the same zone. And down to the southeast, you see emerald mines uh, and the Tarkovai deposit. And here is the pegmatite field again. It's not necessary. Here is a very poor image, but it's the only one I have from the Makursha mine when it was working. And the young photographer, you saw the picture from Ursinka. It's her father to the right, Sergei Borshov. And here he is to the left. He collected this, the largest topaz specimen, blue topaz, found in the Ural Mountains, 43 and a half kilo. While he took it out of the pocket, it knocked out all his front teeth. He was a very good geologist, so was the chief geologist. Now, here is Wenda Wilson. He is the chief editor of the Mineralogical Record in the USA. And he's an excellent artist, as besides the geologist mineralogist. And here is his dream pocket, the Charles pocket from Mersinka, wonderful painting with the different morphologies of the topaz. And here is another pocket. Here is one of the nicest uh, single topaz crystals I've ever seen from, from this area. Uh, one thing to mention is the first generation in most type of pockets, barrels, topaz, tourmaline, whatever it is, they usually become larger and they may not be of the best quality. Then often you have a second and third generation, sometimes a fourth inside the pocket. Of course, you can have the very, very first one in frozen in the matrix, which I don't call the pocket. I'm speaking about pocket generations here. Here is an H1 found by Georges Igor Gurkov, who worked the Makrusha mine. Here's in the Fersma Museum. And you see dated 1927. Two more beautiful on matrix. And here is one fantastic in the Mim Museum. This belonged to Anna Nobel. And you see the different colors of, of barrels here. The one to the left was from 1976 in Golodnaya mine, typical topaz. And to the right, a green one. This was found in the early 1700s. So one of the oldest documented uh, barrels from the area. Now this geological map, which is taken from Mineralogical Almanac, this is a wonderful magazine. 
it was called World of Stones when it started. I think everyone in the West was absolutely astonished to be able to read Russian authors or Soviet authors, I should say, wrote about the deposit, mostly were Russian, but also from other former Soviet states. And finally, this came out about Mersinka. I highly encourage the authors that they should do that. And these were two uh, men and a woman geologists uh, living in Ilmer Reserve. And they wrote a fantastic book about Mersinka. Here's a geological map. What you can see the granite intrusions and the blue are the pegmatite veins that are connected, uh, sometimes in the granite, sometimes right next to it. And you can see some of the squared uh, limestones here also. Here is the mine. A specimen to the right is in fact three specimens. It's a specimen with the champagne topaz, blue topaz and green barrel are separate. And here is the cross section of Kasyonitsa mine. So I participated, I went there in 92, 93 to participate in the mining. They made the shaft a 30 meter, made the tunnel a 20 meter and mining uh, tunnel a 30 meter. And I saw many of the pockets. I documented what they found. I gave them the proper tools to take out the specimens. However, it was very strange. Of course, the chief Jolly, he was not always in the mine. He had to plan and handle the whole thing operation. So many of the crystals to the right, you see the upper, the upper two green ones from pocket 261. They were broken off and they, were, they didn't even have fragments of those crystals. And they, they had partly matrix to one of them. So it was probably that the miners, they were not, had not been paid salary for a year at the mining company when I visited the first time. Therefore, when I came back half a year later, I bought some specimens. The chief geologist told me, how, how do you dare to come back? How, are you not afraid? He said, why should I be afraid? Well, every the whole village knows that you were the one who brought the money the first time. And here they will kill anyone if they know you have 10, $20 in the pocket. And I will not tell now, but I did have visit one night that I, managed to escape. Uh, in fact, it was one of the first nights, three miners who came to the place that was sleeping completely alone at the end of the village. Here you can see the beauty of some of the barrels, some of them, most of them I will discuss in detail. And here is one that was found uh, in pocket four, which I saw at 28 meter depth, a fabulous 16 and a half centimeter crystal, 950 gram, 16.6, it says, I think it's 16.5 and has a black terminal shirl in between the aquamarine and smoky quartz. Heliodor, I think the very, very rare few ones we see from yours are really the, the best Heliodors in the world in that they are not etched at all. They're razor sharp, beautiful, beautiful yellow color. Some are deeper color, some are yellowish green, but they are just very rare to see. A few museums, the Russian museums have a few luckily preserved. And here is one of my first images of, of Helidors. More. Now I show you a great variety. What is interesting is to see the morphology. They're from different, uh, on the left side, you have a laying one green to the very left, the long one that's from Shaitanka, it's doubly terminated. So each deposit has a specific style. Uh, with a few friends, we have analyzed from many, many uh, deposits to, to look, uh, look at them in more in detail. This left crystals was 19 centimeter, beautiful specimen. To the right, they're drilling in a pocket, pocket number seven, uh, where I found a turmalin that turned out to be a new species. But in fact, I found it in January 1993. And in August, I think it was described as new species of a couple of crystals from unknown place uh, origin in, in, uh, uh, in California, Southern California. Here is the variety of colors of barrels. Now there is no such thing as uninteresting minerals, not even quartz. Somebody think quartz, you find millions and millions of tons, but every mineral tells a story of the formation of exact conditions, how it formed. And even in, within the same vein or vein system, it varies from one pocket to another. Even within a pocket, you can have different colors and different morphology. The morphology will depend on the exact conditions on that specific spot in the pocket. And here is another photo of some of the most lovely, lovely pieces that was ever found here. And if you look to the right, the Heliodor was found in pocket 261, 12 meters. It's in fact 12.3 to 12.8 meter depth by miner Balakin. I know the man, I've seen the pocket. Uh, so when you document pieces, it has such much more value than it's just from Bersink and Euromountains. 
Now, some may say, why is that? Well, from a historical viewpoint, but from also genetic geological viewpoint, if you have many specimen from one vein, if you have many, many from many veins in the same uh, field, you can do serious studies on them, on anything, inclusions, on etching, whatever you like, but they need to be well documented. Here is a photo from my first visit. My camera froze, in fact, so I photographed a lovely collection of one of the geologists there, but the camera was frozen, so I, I could not change the setting of time or aperture, nothing. So it was very difficult. And that the geologists had a, a wonderful genetic collection, not the best crystals. They were not allowed to keep the best crystals, but for the genesis of the deposit, wonderful. Now, is there life after death trespass here and found out? I, I used this in, in a talk about Afghanistan and one could use it by Russia because Russia in the 1990s, it was very, very dangerous. It was complete anarchy. Sometimes you read here in the West, oh, it was uh, democracy. It was no democracy, it was anarchy. It was criminals from Russia, the one who could fight their way, the one who got hand of a, a gun, the one who could cheat and trick the most, who were running everything. So the serious scientists at university, for instance, to, they didn't get salary. So to make some money to buy food, they had to go on the street to sell Coca-Cola once a day for a few hours to make a few pennies to buy some potatoes. And the chief geologist of this mining village, he had his own cow. He was growing his own potato. They had been running 300 mines, but he had to do because they, they didn't have any money. And you can imagine the specimens I bought there they could pay the miners for a whole year back. It was fantastic, but also very dangerous for me. So here is in the Kassionitsa mine, 30 meter level. These are all historical pictures now. And in fact, I've never seen any made by any of the Russian geologists. So I was the first and last Western visitor, but I documented and I have many, many pictures, many that I need to scan. And the pocket to the left here, pocket 201 on 30 meter level, I will show you later one of the barrels that came out of there. And here's chief geologist in the middle and Sergei Borshov to the right. Oh, that's the same one. And then you think <clears throat> in winter, the picture to the right is a picture taken by my friend Nikolai Belenkov. It's now, he sent me pictures here during the weekend. So in the weekend I put in, he and young mineral collection heroes, they are digging underground, small places going into the mines even in winter. And of course it's warmer underground. But when I was there in January 1993, uh, the clay was frozen at 27 meter depth in the mine. So here is digging one pocket. I was the drilling again. Here you can see some of the mineralizations just around the pocket. You see the garnets, you see the short tourmalines. I took some barrels and matrix here. I gave some to the Museum of Natural History in Stockholm from this uh, pocket. Here is beautiful star mica feldspars. And here are some of the finest pieces they found in the Cassiones de Barros Topaz is from the Macrusha mine. And almost all blue topaz from the Euros is from the Macrusha mine, even though usually labels only the same Rosinka. The piece to the left is called the King Lear and St. Petersburg University. And it arrived to their collection, I think, before 1885. So it's a very old piece. Here is a Helidor. A broken piece was cut by Michael Gray in the USA to the right, and my wife made a design for a ring for herself. But that has exact known origin, this gemstone, which I think is much more interesting than it's just a diamond from Africa, which is Africa is very big and has many, many uh, localities. So here is the green barrel that was found in Cassiones, and to the right you see a very rare sample in that <clears throat> it has a double terminate smoky quartz, a small barrel and a topaz. The three together is not so commonly seen. And sometimes you even have a tourmaline uh, in association with two of them. Uh, the mining company brought this specimen in April 1994 for me to photograph. So the biggest ones in the background belongs to the mining company. And that was to try to ask for some more money to run the company in hard times, ask money from Moscow. And he was testing of uh, the color, of the, uh, just color film. Here to the left, Rock Carrier was a dear friend. He photographed this in the British Museum long, long time ago. To the right is a fantastic old, it was uh, uh, pictures in brown. Uh, it's photographed by, from, by James Elliott, for Fine Minerals International. It's now in the MIM Museum. And it was labeled as from Rusinka, which I believe it's now it's labeled as from Ilmen Mountains. I do not know where that information comes from. 
And here is this from um, Balakin. Harwood Mineralogical Museum has two very old famous uh, specimens. The left one, the green one, is doubly terminated from Soloton Agora, and the one to the right, Levashin Agora. Now, both I, when I went there shortly after, I looked at old documents about mines, the depth, how big they were, and a dear friend in Moscow, he has done the same, and we came to the same conclusion where it really is from. Probably there was one of the local richer guys working the mine, Levashin, and they called his mine for Levashin, which we've never found documentation in literature. Maybe it is somewhere. And you can see that I appreciate having been there. So I made uh, pictures December 93 and 2015 of my two sons with the specimens from this mine, from pocket one and 99 in Kasionitsa. Uh, to the left, you see a famous old painted found in 1828, Big Heliodor. And this is the one, it's from Starsevayama. It's preserved in St. Petersburg Mining Institute. And my wife's ring, it's on exhibit now at the museum. It's in the, in the middle and with a crystal behind it to the left. Uh, here is, to the left was in, in the winter, December 1899 to 1900, at 22 meter depth at uh, Seminitsky and Skaya in they found several hundred kilo of those beautiful etched green uh, barrels, aquamarines we could call them. And this one was bought, I have documentation, was bought in Mersink in 1903. So it fits very well with uh, what we find in literature. Here are some more from, to the right from very rare uh, deposits in Baikal. And here from Svetloy, the one to the left, it's, it's um, quarry south of Yekaterinburg where they took cowling clay from the weathered pegmatite and granite. So you see both a Helidor aquarium and same deposit. Uh, the one to the uh, right is from Chukotka. Northern Siberia. In 1889, it was the world exhibit in Paris and also in 1900. And the Tsaritsa of Russia was giving three large amethysts and they became world famous. And you can look at that color to the left. It has blue, it has red, it has purple. Uh, the best amethyst from Euros is really, really incredible, but it's very rare, the best quality in any gem deposit. If you mind, for instance, the veins around Mursinka, there are hundreds of veins with amethyst. I spoke with the chief geologist that mined many, and he said about 2% of all amethyst is of gem quality, 2%. That means cutting quality. And a few percent of those are really the top quality. Very, very rare, just a few pockets. And to the right, you see one from Artemyeva mine. And the mining company lab labeled depth 12 meter, pocket 52. They said this number, it's just a number. But when I saw the geological cross-section of the mine, I understood exactly where it was from. That should not be a secret. Amethyst is not any strategic mineral, but it was interesting. It was still a secret uh, even after Soviet time. So here is uh, geologist Igor Gurkov, young student mining uh, amethyst in Adu. And you see they do it in winter. Doesn't matter. Russian people are not fussy. They had a very harsh living from 1917 till 1990. Um, it made them, they're not lazy. They're not too afraid of working. The people are interested in geology, you know, they go out if it's minus 30, 40, it's, it's really not a big thing. If it's minus 40, 45, then it's starting to get very dangerous. Here is an old amethyst. I showed you this picture when we saw by the church in Mursinka, and you, I said the background. That was the mines that were started by Italians and in the late 1700s. And this crystal document was collected in 1820. And here you can see that superb color, probably because it's not all faceted and great. They didn't cut luckily. So it's one of the few crystals that survived, but it had beautiful large uh, amethyst in, in Italian mines. This one is no less um, uh, colorful. It's not the deep color, but it's better color than it appears here. It's not so great, it's purple. It's beautiful, beautiful purple. It's a Brazilian law twin with a phantom inside. Here's another doubly terminated. Here is now we come to the emerald pits of the Euros. The Euros had the largest emerald mine in the world, one and a half kilometer long. I had no idea if they were still mining. So it was a really big trouble to get permission to go both to Mursinka and here. I, I had a whole list of mines I wanted to go to. I was invited by the university, a professor at the University of Gemology and the history of Gemology. 
And there was a um, metallurgical company who helped me to have a car that would get and a driver to get me around. But then why do you want to go? Who is paying for you? Well, I, I wish somebody was paying. I was just a very poor student. I could barely afford even the flight to Euros. I didn't speak Russian. I know Danyat Vodkavara, four words. I didn't even know Spasiba, Privyat, nothing. And my wife, who now happens to be Russian since 14, well, my wife since 14 years, I never speak Russian with her, but she said I was totally crazy to go. It was very dangerous. And it was said that the most dangerous place of all was, in fact, this emerald mine for the reason that criminals were drawn there to try to steal emeralds and try to make business of them. Of course, I was invited by the director of the mine and the chief geologist and the geologist, so luckily, I didn't have any problem with it, but I only got permission the second last day of my stay in Yekaterinburg. And, and that day there was no car available from university. So I think they were told, even though it was not Soviet Union, they were still sensitive. And I didn't know why. They mined the emerald and CRISPR for strategic, for beryllium. So for military purpose, if uh, the metal beryllium has the same properties as aluminum, but it's lighter. So if you make some beams with, with beryllium in an jet fight or whatever they did with it, it's lighter and you can save on weight or you can mix it with copper and you can have a feather, it's stronger than feather steel, you can vibrate two, three billion times without uh, fatigue. So this we didn't know in the West and uh, I think I found out after I had been there. Here's Jaldi, you can just see, uh, in fact, I will not show this old map so long, you can see to the right here, it says asbestos mine. So they're serpentinites and to the left, I better look on this map, to the left here, the pink is the granite. So all along the contact zone here, we have metasomatic. It means that there is beryllium from the granite, but it was solution. So there are some pigmentized stringers, but it's in fact a mica schist, we could call it. There are many other minerals except for a phlogopite. There's a chloride, there are, there are many talc and so on. And they're very, very um, complex um, deposit. They've drilled down to 600 meter and you still find uh, emeralds at 600 meter. So here you can see just very complex geology. Here's some old pictures from the emerald mines. And to the right here, you see one of the first underground pictures ever, ever taken here that I took uh, to the, it looks like it's black and white, but it's in fact a color. The mica schist is, is very dark. Here is the sorting of emerald. Emerald, another barrel by John Sinkanka, is a very, very good. I highly recommend for anyone interested in the, the emerald, different barrels, uh, including emerald, with great literature reference, which I went through when, when I was a student at university. I ordered every book that I could from there. Many came from Moscow State University, where they were so kind and lent it out to Western universities already in the 80s. And here is, uh, I think I'm one of the few who visited underground and in situ several of the emerald deposits in the Urals. To the up left and below is Sretensky mine and to up right is Marinsky mine. And here is a fun photo, uh, a friend in the old <laughs> mining, with the old mining telephone. It's not a real emerald, it's, it's, a, it's a simulation of wood which is painted, but she was holding onto the phone and I handed this specimen to her. Here is a very old famous emerald. This painting is in St. Petersburg Mining Institute and they didn't know where the specimen was. I had seen the specimen in, in, at, at the museum in München and here it is to the right. Very, very beautiful, large plate, the largest beautiful plate of emeralds from Russia. Here is the mining offices. And sadly, some years later, <clears throat> this was all the beautiful intarsia was all gone and the building abandoned when they closed the mining company. Here's a big great crystal to the left in a friend's hands at the Fersman Museum. And to the right, you can see there's phenakite. Phenakite was also described from the Euro mines. Besides the crystal with alexandrite effect, alexandrite, uh, named after Solar Alexander, we're just coming to this. Here's the emerald, big emerald. And here are beautiful emeralds. The one to the left my wife is wearing came from the backside of this specimen. Now we come, you see the emerald to the left and alexandrite to the right. Alexandrite is dark green in a daylight changing to purplish red in candescent light. Here are emeralds that are banded. Beautiful banded by Valentina Alp to the left. And here is director Firstman Museum to the right with 
fake crystals in matrix, very, very well made. And interesting, I found this Alexandrite tea, I call it to the left. When you put a bit of lemon in it, it changes colors and has exactly the Alexandrite colors, some old labels of Alexandrite. So Alexandrite is a very rare mineral and it was first found in the, in, in the Euros in, as chrysoberyl and only 1833-34 it was found and described with the color changing in some small crystals. Here is some of the history in Nils von Nordenfeld named Alexandrite, Perovsky was involved in the find, Gustav Rose made the first mineral lot, good description. And he was given that piece and Maximilian von Duke of Leuchtenberg is what owned this piece to the right and Kochibis uh, Drews to the right is the uh, best large Alexandrite in Russia, probably in the world. And Kokcharov, he has specimens in the British Museum now and the crystal doors with the color change by Franz von Bert, 1842 to the right are just lovely. Here's the detail. So Karl Schmetzer is a very good uh, German scientist, gem expert, and he published a book about Russian Alexandrites. And I highly recommend that. It's a thin book, very well researched, and there is everything correct in it, I would say. And here is the uh, big drusa. Here is a phenakite or chloride from the type locality. And the mining company has some emeralds, paint drawings from kids also, really lovely. To the right there, the Santa Claus almost with the, in fact, the Santa Claus clothes, these clothes comes from a part in Northern Euros where there was tradition to wear these uh, red and white clothes. And here's from the our exhibit at the museum in Luxembourg. You sleeping yet? Now I will go a little faster because we still have a few more mines to go. Quartz from uh, maybe Dauphiné, France or from the Euros. There is one vein in the Mersinka field with such. And from Southern Euros, we have giant quartzes from polar Euros, almost as large. This is 984 a kilo, the one to the left, and another Italian amethyst. Here is 4.2 ton quartz. And it was mined for piezo quartz, for military purpose, technical purpose. And here is one in Moscow State University with beautiful inclusions. They are uh, tourmaline and sericite. And here is citrine from Molkovka, uh, polar Euros that my wife cut. Design the ring, other Euro quartzes. Oh, that was a double one. And of course, they also find cyberite. This is from uh, Extra Lapis. One page was missing there. And here you can see the map. We look again, Adoy, Shaitanka, Lipovka, and Asbest to the right. So you see it's a north south trend along the granite contact. Some beautiful, beautiful rubellite. The first was found in late 1700s, and then in 1805, 1810, they mined a lot of them. And uh, after 1820, it wasn't that much, but they found some new in the Povka. A bit further south in the Kamenka River, they discovered in 1850 uh, imperial topaz, oranges to deep pinkish red purplish. This is the first one known. It's documented it arrived to Sweden in 1850. And it was described 1853 by Kokcharov. Here is pink topaz to the left and Queen of Sweden wearing pink topaz to the right. It could be from Brazil or Euros, this I do not know. And here is the Ilmen Mountains. We are not going to touch much upon it, but also very famous in the south of Euros. This, this pegmatite had amosite and probably topaz. There's a pocket to, just behind the people in the left photo. And the amosite crystal, very nice found. And there is one pegmatite. There are several different generations. So when one studied the deposit, one must really look careful. There are several different types, completely different generation of pegmatites in the same area. And this is often the case. And Ilmen Mount, one of the most studied areas in the world. They're still studying. Here are big sapphires in the pegmatite. Lovely pegmatite, pegmatite 298. The young fellow to, to the left found uh, the best pegmatite among many gemologists who were on a field expedition. Mark, so he's, he's really a mineralogist for the future. Here is a ruby, so not only sapphire, but the rubies, uh, this is from Rice in uh, polar Urals. Now around Mersinka, there are also some of the corundum, which is red, the multicolor sapphires and some red rubies. In Nishnitagil, now we come to the famous malachite. They were mining iron here and they came upon beautiful malachite in Mednorodyansk. So it means the place for working, copper. 
And Gumyshevsky's further to the south of Yekaterinburg, 80 kilometers south, and they found uh, it was it was worth 2000 BC already. So this many people don't know, but there are many mines, in fact, that were worked very early on. And there's one cave in Siberia that has uh, a lot of very old tools. Um, here's the cutting works. This incredible malachite was found in 1774. It's in St. Petersburg Mining Institute. You can go and see it there today. Here is in, uh, it's in the Hermitage. To the left is malachite, as you see it when you find it, often in karst in limestone. And here is a cut one to the right. And here is the Hermitage in St. Petersburg. And here is a book about malachite. Uh, it was written by Vlad uh, Vladislav Borisovich Semyonov and it was published in 100,000 books in Soviet times and it was given to all schools, all universities, all libraries. So they had a very, very serious education about geology and minerals and gemstones in Soviet times. Who is publishing today 100,000 books? And this is a very, very good book. It's in fact two books, I should say. Um, it was the Malachite room built in 1830s after they found this used 480 ton boulder in Nishni Tagil. And it was also used last right from, uh, from Lake Baikal um, on the pillars. And there are also new Malachite deposits. This is from uh, southwestern Siberia, Kemerovsky Oblast. And here is this mine, huge gold mine. And you see the deposit, beautiful Asherite Malachite. I've been lucky I visited here and dug myself Asherite Malachite from the primary deposit. Rhodonite is also another non-transparent gem that was heavily used in, in Russia. And this sarcophagus was done, it was found in 1888, a huge boulder, 48 tons. And they transported it, uh, was very large job in those days, transport a big boulder. Oops, no, I don't know what happened, sorry. You see it okay? Something is happening. But, okay, Mayakovska metro station in, in uh, Moscow is also from uh, Rhodonite on the uh, columns to here. It's beautiful, beautiful. Rod Rhodonite, I should say. Something is happening. I have a little hiccup here. Can you still hear me? Yeah, it's still there. Okay. I think you are looping. Yes, yeah, so I will go quickly. I will go here. Yeah. I will see here. We will go to Demantoid. It's also gemstone found in Euros. Uh, there is a, well, in fact, there are two big quarries. It was first found by Nishni Tagil, by Bobrovka stream. Here is by Bobrovka and Shelyabinsk. Some miners, they dig in the forest here. Some of their finds, this is, I think, both from Nishni Tagil and here. But cut stones, you see the variety of colors. Some beautiful enclosures of Mia Dixon, Tala International. Now, here are very, very chrome rich, very strong, but they're red from the same deposits. Here's a beautiful enclosures. Photograph by Arjuna Yasuti, Salina Jewels, and here's beautiful horsetail enclosure of the Mantoid, which is famous. And here is one by Lucas Vasari in 29 carat mounted from Bobroka. Just another one. Okay, I will show now the very fast, the last one. We have seven minutes, well, eight minutes, something if we should keep the time. Sapphire from Lake Baikal. Adun Chilon to the left, Chernavagola to the right. Here is a cross section. So here we have an example of a granite intrusion, which is with the crosses. Now what is on the surface is different. To the left, the mountains were eroded. There we have pegmatites. To the right, we have grace and it means there was going so the granite became porphyry, was closer to the surface. We have another, another temperature, another form of crystallization. Thin fissures full of barrel crystals or lined with topaz and smoky quartz. Here is Sherlovagora. Material looks like this. The fluoride to the right is spinel low twin, which is typical of grace and lower temperature. And here's from Adon Chilon, which is pegmatite. Here's Adon Chilon. This is just an old map of Adon Chilon, and it looks like this. One of the most beautiful deposits I visited in my life. Looks like this from a very rare locality. And then we have the last big locality is Termalins from Malchansk. This is from Extra Lapis. 
wonderful rubellite and multicolored. There is also many different colors, colorless, which turned out to be silicite, rubellite, albite, sometimes lidocortite also. And uh, in August, as you see, 1995, I discovered together with a Russian friend and I had an American friend with me. He wasn't up at the quarry at that time, but we found some small that turned out he analyzed it was rosmanite. Uh, I found in 1995, but in fact, the species was described only three years later. And it was, you see here, rosmanite. From that pocket, all dots were rosmanite. So what is dravites down to the left from a, a completely other pegmatite, Vodrajdelnia, which is this uh, pegmatite. This is an albite to the right, but there's also brown dravites there. And here's morganite. And here is beautiful albite from Vodrajdelnia, topaz from Rolga. Rolga was another famous deposit uh, south of Nersinsk, north of this area. Here is in the British Museum, Rolga topaz. And of course, we must mention the last thing, diamonds of Russia. Uh, this is a huge diamond octagon, 53.05 uh, um, carats in the Mim Museum from Fine Minerals International. It has some enclosures of pyrotite. And here was an old publication about diamonds. They were very meticulous when they found them in the 1950s, photographing, looking at enclosures, beautiful map. So the diamond basang, it's a huge reading with, here is one, the mirror pipe, and with an enclosure that Michael Bogomolov made, beautiful. And here's a mirror pipe from space and the dynasty. It was cut from 179 carat rough diamond, which was named the Romanov. And it's document, as you see, found at Nyurbinska Kimblite pipe and Sacha. The largest is D color, the best color of diamond, 51.38 cal uh, carats and VVS perfect cut. And this is Alrosa Diamond Mining Company. Now, the last thing I'm mentioning is gold and platinum. Here is gold wire from Lena River, very old piece. And here are gold on the upper shelf and platinum below. Platinum often contains other, like often rich in iron, iridium, osmium, and so on, and chromium. And in Siberia, we also have platinum crystals, extremely rare. The one on top is the perhaps the oldest known crystal that only says Katrenberg, Siberia, but it could be that this is in fact from the condor intrusion in Siberia. And you see to the right here, this beautiful rim. It almost looks like a meteorite crater. It's eroded in the center of this intrusion. There are two more in Siberia. You can easily find this if you go to Google Earth and go near the uh, east coast of Khotsky Amore, you find it very easily. You can, can see, you can, very easy to find. And nephrite, we must mention also. Now there are many more gems in, in Russia. And nephrite is uh, one where you have many big deposits. Jade, not so much. There are plenty of agates, jasper. And here's a fantastic cat's eye nephrite from Jeffrey Bergman, 5.558 carat. Everything we speak about gems now. Nephrite, you can mine thousands of tons, but when you come to quality, a stone like this is completely unique. As I said, the kids are out digging now in the winter, and we cannot leave Russia without mentioning some of their master. This is Viktor Tuslikov, and we have several of his beautiful cut stones in the exhibit here at the museum now. And the one to the right is a topaz he cut. He's a real master, and there are many of them who do carvings. And Nikolai Medvedev, uh, he moved to USA a long time ago. He does this incredible intarsia. I would love to buy one of those one day when I get rich. I would really love to. And the last few pictures is more about the culture of Russia. We got two minutes to go to see the culture. Of course, I cannot show you everything culture of Russia. This is a beautiful lunch in Moscow. And now we don't travel anything because of COVID. My wife said, I'm longing to come to Moscow and see the Christmas decorations and have a nice lunch. This is, Victor was the man who took me to this beautiful restaurant in no private house. Here is a gem show in Moscow. And of course, there's wonderful theaters, this Bolshoi Theater, St. Petersburg, my first visit with my wife. I happen to marry a Russian wife, and you can understand why. The quality comes from the inside, but it's also on the outside, as many things in Russia. And I think it's sad that Russia is very mis, perhaps misunderstood and, and backspoken. Russia is a very, very uh, friendly nation, really, the people, and they have extremely high education, higher than the Western Europe since Soviet times. The geologists and medical doctors are those that I know best, the mineralogists, and they are absolutely highly educated. 
I have a few pictures from my children and family and Russia. So thanks to my children, they have, I'm bringing them to all kinds of crazy uh, geological sites, acid, sulfur lakes, and into mines. And they always came with me and they liked it, but it's not always. And this, my son, he was dreaming at, at night at our summer house about complex garnets. And the interesting thing, there's only one place on that, in that whole area where exactly this morphology shape of garnet occurs. My parents always took me and then many friends of Russia. My, I, first I put in only guys here because most mineralists are guys, but most ladies at museum and most gemaldis are ladies. And I have so many friends I could show plenty. Russian winter is not bad, it's also beautiful. And you can go, I would suggest if you want to travel, try it with the summer first, the, when the nights are long end of June, July, and then you can try it on winter for a weekend in St. Petersburg, Moscow, see the museums. It's really beautiful. Oops, here my son to the left in Siberia. You can see here healthy eating meat product, pizza party. They are very Americanized, city mall in the middle of, this is in the middle of Siberia. This is a food store where they're also cooking. And the, the food is fantastic. It's natural product to the right. You see natural berries in the, in the yogurt, frozen yogurt. So I must say it's easy to gain there, but at least it's healthy gaining. And shashlik barbecue. I barbecued in minus 42 degrees outside. Very nice for kids, so they have a lot of organized for the children, I must say, very high educational level already for three, four year olds. So thank you so much. I'll be happy to see you again at some other conference. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I will stop sharing. Yeah, thank you, Peter, for this passionate and impressive talk. I've never seen in my, my life so many minerals even not in our fantastic exhibition. I think there are many minerals also in our uh, Russian minerals in our exhibition, uh, isn't yes. it, Simon? Yes. yes, it's right. Yeah, we put a lot of specimen from Russia and it's, it was very important for me when I decided to do this type of uh, exhibit. Uh, people very well know specimen from Brazil and from Africa but Russia is so rich in mineralogy and gemstones that I asked directly to Peter to help me about that. Yes, yeah, it's perhaps an, an interesting uh, question here from Adolfo de Basilio. Yes. Um, yeah, thank you, Peter, for your wonderful presentation. How many mines have you visited in your life? And well, is there uh, any left you didn't visit? Oh, there are thousands and thousands, of but it's interesting, I will just tell you very briefly, 1995, I brought two friends to Finland to visit mines, and on the way, they asked me exactly this question, so I started, and they kept accounting, and I started with the southernmost province of Sweden, I, I did every province, and then Norway and Finland, and I did uh, each country, and they counted to 1,908 at that time, and after I used to say many years, I said 2,500, but I know it's way over 3,000. I cannot say an exact number. I would need to do it again, and I would forget probably at least 100 or 200, you know. But these are working or old mines and quarry specific ones. And then, of course, I've seen thousands of veins. So that's it. And it's not the number that's important. It is more how much you studied and how if you really looked from morning till evening in Scandinavia when I was young. I could go out five in the morning. And I know me and a friend one week and we checked out 19 different deposits one day because you go out five in the morning and you're there till 11 at night. Next day you continue five in the morning till midnight. So because we have a midnight sun in much of, of Sweden and we have light till 1130 at night. So to see 20 deposits in one day, you have almost 20 hours and you think, oh, only one hour in each place. Well, if there's specific veins and quarries near each other, you can do that. And that's recognizing just to see which ones you want to study more. Then to the two, three most important, you come back many, many times. There's some veins that are visited way over hundred times, like the Hux or pegmatite in my home quarry, of course. Yeah, and among all these pictures and specimens and mines you have mentioned now in your talk, uh, which yeah, situation was perhaps the most challenging for you? Uh, well, when I came to Russia the first two times, first time I didn't know the language. I came back six months later and I was very surprised myself. 
I somehow had hand, I didn't study, I was a bad, I had too much studies at university, I didn't study Russian, I should have done this half year. But when I came back, I could understand, I could communicate. So I had a one American friend who asked me if he could come with me on a tour in Russia. So I took him my third trip to Russia. <clears throat> we traveled one month in Siberia, Urals, and then finished off in Ukraine and Moscow. And he, he was astonished. He said, how can you speak Russian? All, everything I knew, I learned in the mind. So it was all geology, this I know. And I read geological books, but daily talk about something else I was not very good at, I must say. And, and then I said, okay, you try. He said, oh, you have so easy to know. I said, no, no, no. You try now from the morning, everything everyone says, you repeat every word in your head. And then, oh, that one I recognize. And suddenly you put two, two three words together and you start to understand. So I learned the Russian only by hearing in the minds, in fact. And I think the most challenging is it was to come there the first time, not knowing the language and criminal times, and I'm not going to detail of this, but you have to be very careful. I arrived with my American friend in the middle of the night to Yekaterinburg Airport, and the person who was there to meet us was not there, and there were only criminals. Lucky there was one lady with the sign of a German guy name. He didn't come. I spoke German to her, and she said, don't tell the guys who are driving. Don't tell that you're not this person. Those were criminals. So some German coming to do some business there. She took us and I showed her in the middle of the night. I told my friend, you jump out of the car and you just run this direction. I go up and divert attention. I was not sold. I had been in the armories. I can divert their attention. I will find you. You just keep going along the road. Don't stop whatever you hear. And he was scared to death. I was scared to death, but we got into town and I recognized the street and we found my friend and there was many scary points for him, so, but it's well, I think he remembers this one of his most memorable trips ever. We've been on six continents together studying pegmatites. Yeah, um, yeah. It's a question here from Ray Hill, um, who uh, loves the cat's uh, the cat's eye, uh, Charlie Cabochon, and yes. he's asking where uh, it is from. Uh, I, what I understood it was from Siberia, but I didn't have time to speak with Jeffrey Berman. I just managed to get this beautiful photograph from, okay. from him. So I will tell you, Ray, when I find out. Okay. Question from Christopher Clark, uh, who knows that you are knowledgeable regarding uh, silver. And, um, and as you have mentioned, gold and platinum of Russia, are there any significant mines producing specimen quality silver in Russia? Yes, there, there is one mine which is almost unknown. It's in the very north uh, east of Siberia. And now I'm just a little tired, so I'm slipping my neck. But, but uh, I can write to you. And this, in the miners' office there, they have a picture and they don't even realize what this is. I mean, the, the importance, there is a photo on the wall that they took of a pocket with wire silvers, huge wire silvers inside the pocket. There is no such photo anywhere from Kongsberg, Norway. And in this mine, they didn't care so much. I've seen two fantastic specimens of wire silver from this mine on matrix, one big and one smaller. So there are wire silvers in Russia, yes. <laughs> and the road to go there is terrible. You have to go 400 kilometers on, on road that you will need to change tires. <laughs> yeah, a personal question. What about your next trips? Well, we will see. Now I have a few Question more years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I have a few more years until I retire. And of course, this COVID put a stop. I did not travel much the, the last year, but we will see. I, you know, I also go around here in Luxembourg. There are interesting deposits. Simon know it. We have gone to the German side. They're here in Luxembourg also. Belgium, France, not far away. So far away place I go during my holidays. <clears throat> and currently, I don't have any planned holiday. Maybe next summer I will go somewhere. Of course, I have a whole long list where I would like to, to visit. And many places, uh, I usually go alone because I cannot guarantee the safety for other people. And also, it gives me 100% attention to the geologists, to the miners I meet. I can listen and take in everything. Uh, if I go with somebody else, that, that uh, um, period of attention is reduced to 10, 20%. Because another person wants to know about something else, I want to know everything about geology, the mineralogy, the history, 
a culture I want to know so much and I can ask the questions and I can get so many questions through also. So that may be egoistic, but to, to reach the results, to learn about the boss, that's the best way for me. Okay. Peter, you could perhaps talk about the last we do in 2020 in March. Uh, yes. It was uh, very... Yeah, for a week, <laughs> for a week and uh, I, I brought Simon had asked me for a long time. So just for a weekend, I took... This is, in fact, sometimes I do. I can go to Scandinavia. I work till six Friday night. I take a flight. I arrive in the evening and I have Saturday, Sunday in, in the quarries of southern Norway or Sweden or wherever it is, or Ukraine, as it was this case. And I fly back Sunday afternoon. So I often go over the weekend. And we went to uh, Volodars, which is Chamber Pegmatites of Ukraine, very, very famous. And then, of course, later uh, came COVID. So this was, <laughs> but, but Simon had asked me for a long, long time. And finally, we made it. And we will go another time because uh, we will maybe coming summer, it will be possible. I, I, I need my holiday with my family and then I take some part of the holiday for, for geology, min, mineralogy, of course. Yeah. But often it's, it's weekend trips and sometimes I can take a day off together with the weekend and sometimes it's Easter holiday or Christmas holiday. So I need to use even Christmas New Year holiday for my geological trips. And coming back to Russia, um, question from Priscilla Guru. Uh, where do you want to go for minerals when you are can when you can return to Russia? If when I can, oh, yes. uh, well, I know Priscilla. There, there are many places in former Soviet Union also that I would like to go: Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, and in Russia there are many many deposits. You know, for me it is I want to go to the Kola Peninsula. I didn't go there for the reason that is very easy for me as a Swede. I was living in Sweden. I could jump in my car and drive up to Kola. So very easy. So I always aimed. My time is limited. My money is limited because I don't. I have another day job, and I need to save the money and use my holiday money to go to see mines. And hope my pray my wife will not be angry with me. You know. So <laughs> so most I, I have friends who are, who are in who are paid for geology. And one friend today wrote me, "Oh, now I don't work for the same institute, so they will not pay my participation in conference." Well. Nobody ever paid my participation. And it's very hard for a private person to go to a conference or go to a trip because uh, if I need to, I can buy 23 days off from work, but it's very, very expensive. I lose income and it cost me. So it cost me a fortune to go on a two week trip if I need to take uh, time off. And Kuala Peninsula, I would really like, and that should be at least two week trip or a month trip. And that's of course in summer, otherwise you won't find anything unless you go underground. Yeah, are there some other questions to the audience? No. Yeah, so I think, thank you again for this very, very passionate um, uh, talk. And uh, to the audience, um, even if you're not in Luxembourg, so I'm inviting you um, to our to to try your best to come to Luxembourg to visit our um, exhibition on minerals and gems uh, from dark to light with our curator perhaps uh, Simon Filippo. Um, yeah, if you cannot, I have uh, written um, the link uh, for a 3D tour in the chat. You can also find the same link on our internet um, page and it's worthy and um, yeah so for those who are living in Luxembourg who have the chance we are um, we self we have the chance to um, to be open so nearly all day except Monday from uh, 10 to uh, from 10 a.m to 6 uh, p.m so come to the museum it's better than ever every uh, shopping center at this moment. So, <laughs> and uh, yeah, <laughs> to, to, to visit the exhibition, to see some uh, wonderful gems and, um, and, and, and minerals. And uh, every month there's a visit, a guided tour with Simon. So come to the museum and thank you again, Peter, for your talk.
thank you very much. For yeah, thank you again, Peter, for your talk and also for your participation to this exhibit. It's You're most welcome. Very, thank you very much. Very, 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 yeah. very and see you again, perhaps for our next uh, talk on uh, minerals. Uh, and this time it will be Simon himself. Uh, it will be on the 12th January. Um, Simon will speaking about a field trip in Brazil, in, in Brazil uh, with together, I think, with uh, Professor Kazdan. Uh, and there will be some, again, some very fantastic photos from minerals and um, yeah, some science too. So see you again and uh, have a nice evening too. Yes, uh, bye bye to everybody. Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, bye bye. Bye bye.